As nightfall plunged the tumultuous waters of the Pacific into darkness, American battleship USS Washington raced toward Guadalcanal. With bated breath, her hardy crew readied themselves for battle, anticipating the violent clash that lay before them. A Japanese bombardment group was rapidly moving in on the war-torn tropical island, hell-bent on destroying Allied positions there to clear the way for a full-blown invasion. Navigating the infamous stretch of sea known as Iron Bottom Sound, alongside her fellow battleship USS South Dakota and four destroyers, an ominous blip on Washington's search radar let Rear Admiral Willis Ching Lee know they had located the enemy fleet. Under his command, Task Force 64 began the attack. Washington let rip a devastating assault with the nine thunderous Mach 6 guns that made up her main battery, while her secondary guns launched star shells to illuminate the Japanese positions. A ferocious firefight ensued. South Dakota took heavy fire, and in this chaos, a sudden barrage of torpedoes sliced through the water, heading straight for USS Washington. Having not built any new battleships since the Colorado class in the early 1920s, by the mid-1930s, the General Board of the U.S. Navy was keen to launch a bigger vessel with greater firepower. The USS Washington belonged to this new class of battleship, named North Carolina, after the first and only other example of this type. With an overall length of 728 feet 9 inches and a standard displacement of 35,000 long tons, increasing to 44,800 long tons at full combat load, Washington was certainly an imposing force on the water, carrying 1,800 officers and enlisted men during peacetime, though this would eventually grow to 99 officers and 2,035 enlisted men during the war. For four General Electric steam turbines, he was steamed from eight Babcock and Wilcox boilers to power the propeller shafts, giving a shaft horsepower of 121,000 and a top speed of 28 knots, equivalent to 32 miles per hour. The initial design of the North Carolina-class battleships featured 14-inch guns in the main battery, respecting the restriction imposed by the Second London Naval Treaty of 1936. However, when Japan withdrew from the treaty on March 27, 1937, the U.S. invoked the Escalator Clause and increased the size of the guns to 16 inches. General Board member Admiral Joseph Reeves made the case for larger guns by explaining how, during the Battle of Jutland in World War I, they had been shown to have significantly greater armor penetration, and suggested that they would be advantageous when using the newly developed indirect method of shooting, in which warships would receive information about enemy positions from aircraft, allowing them to fire at targets beyond the horizon. Initially reluctant, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's government made one last attempt to convince the Japanese to accept the 14-inch limit but they said they would only do so if the U.S. and U.K. agreed to reduce their number of battleships to bring them in line with Japan. Unwilling to make such a sacrifice, on July 10, 1937, the President cleared the use of the larger weapons. No longer restricted, the ship's main battery was given nine 16-inch 45 caliber Mark VI guns capable of ripping through most enemy warships' armor. These were arranged in three triple-gun turrets on the center line. The secondary battery was made up of 20 5-inch 38 caliber dual-purpose guns mounted in twin turrets clustered amidships, with five turrets on either side. Originally, Washington was also armed with an anti-aircraft battery of 16 1.1-inch guns and 18 50 caliber M2 Browning machine guns, though this was later expanded. Unfortunately, Washington's 12-inch thick armored belt, 5.5-inch thick main armored deck, and 16-inch thick main battery gun turret faces had been designed to protect her from opponents with weapons of up to 14 inches. By the time it became clear that the Japanese would not accept the limitation, meaning that Washington may have to face larger guns, it was already too late to upgrade her armor. Still, as Washington's keel was laid down on June 14, 1938, at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, despite increasing German and Japanese expansionism ringing alarm bells among the international community, the United States was still committed to a policy of non-intervention, and it was unclear whether their latest battleship would ever even see a combat situation. USS Washington's hull was launched on June 1, 1940, and after fitting out work, she was officially commissioned on May 15, 1941. Testing would soon reveal some problems with vibration, but attempts to make modifications had to be put on hold when the vicious surprise attacks on Pearl Harbor forced the United States to abandon neutrality and join World War II. As the flagship of Rear Admiral John W. Wilcox Jr.'s Task Force 39, Washington set sail for the British naval base at Scapa Flow in northern Scotland on March 26, 1942. However, just one day into her journey, her wartime career got off to a tragic start when Rear Admiral Wilcox was swept overboard, drowning in the choppy Atlantic waters. In spite of this unfortunate incident, 
Washington and Task Force 39 had to press on, and soon united with the Royal Navy Home Fleet at Scapa Flow to prepare for joint operations. With Task Force 39 now redesignated in Task Force 99, Washington led the ships on their first mission on April 28th, working alongside British vessels to clear the path for a supply convoy to their Soviet allies by conducting a sweep of German warships. However, things would soon take a turn for the worse when Royal Navy battleship HMS King George V, accompanying Task Force 99, accidentally rammed the destroyer Punjabi, also part of the mission, cutting her in two. Punjabi quickly started to sink. Washington, following closely behind, began evasive maneuvers. As she neared the sinking wreck of the Punjabi, the destroyer's depth charges exploded. Luckily for Washington, the explosion was just far enough for her to escape nearly unscathed. Upon inspection, there was only a little damage to her radars and fire control equipment, and a small fuel tank leak, which were quickly addressed. On July 1st, while escorting convoy PQ-17, Washington would once again find herself in another brush with danger. After a reconnaissance error led to false reports of German warships approaching for attack, the Allied vessels were ordered to scatter, leaving them exposed to Roman U-boats and Luftwaffe, between them sinking 24 of the 35 transport ships. After such a pronounced run of bad luck, it was time for Washington to leave Europe and head back to the United States for a refit. With renovations complete, it was now time for USS Washington to test her mettle against a different enemy on the other side of the world. Leaving Brooklyn Naval Yard on August 23, 1942, with an escort of three destroyers, Washington crossed the Panama Canal on her way to Tonga, where she arrived on September 14th to become the flagship of Rear Admiral Willis Ching Lee. Before long, she was assigned to protect convoys, shipping vital supplies and reinforcements to Marines fighting in the strategically crucial Solomon Islands. However, a series of fierce naval battles throughout the fall would leave the U.S. fleet seriously depleted, with many ships lost or heavily damaged. On September 15th, while escorting transports to Guadalcanal, USS Wasp was struck by torpedoes from a Japanese submarine, leading to catastrophic explosions and a rapid sinking. Later, on October 26th, in the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, USS Hornet sustained severe damage from dive bombers and torpedoes, ultimately requiring scuttling after repair efforts failed. With Wasp and Hornet sunk, Washington now found itself one of only three Allied capital ships remaining in the region, along with the carrier Enterprise and the new battleship South Dakota. With few options available to him, when South Pacific Area Commander Admiral William Bull Halsey got word of an impending large-scale Japanese attack, he grouped Washington, South Dakota, and four of the destroyers under Rear Admiral Lee's command as Task Force 16-3. The battleships, with minimal direct combat experience and having operated together for just a few days, were paired with four destroyer escorts from different divisions. Despite these challenges, this combined force was the only hope to stop an enemy fleet intent on bombarding key Allied positions on Guadalcanal, where a grueling land battle was underway. The Japanese bombardment group, led by Admiral Nobutake Kondo, approached Guadalcanal via indispensable strait in the early hours of November 14th. Consisting of the fast battleship Kirishima, the heavy cruisers Takao and Atago, light cruisers Nagara and Sendai, as well as nine destroyers, it vastly outnumbered Lee's task force, now redesignated in Task Force 64. The American ships arrived in the stretch of sea to the north of Guadalcanal, known as Iron Bottom Sound, that evening. At 10.55 p.m., the radar systems aboard Washington and South Dakota began emitting blips. It could mean only one thing. The enemy was in the area. Lee gave the order to prepare for battle, with the four destroyers heading to the front and the battleships bringing up the rear. Identifying a Japanese cruiser and destroyer near Savo Island, he gave the word for both battleships to open fire. At 11.17 p.m., Washington started firing star shells from her secondary guns to light up the enemy targets before attacking with her main battery, with South Dakota joining the onslaught moments later. Despite the intense barrage of the American battleships, the Japanese ships were able to escape from the danger zone unscathed. Realizing his targets had gotten away, Lee ordered a ceasefire five minutes later. At the same time, the battleship's destroyer escort had run into two different groups of Japanese ships who launched a savage torrent of gunfire and torpedoes. After eight minutes of chaos, USS Walkie had fallen victim to a powerful cruiser salvo, while USS Preston met the same fate moments later, both ships now steadily sinking into the depths below. Meanwhile, USS Benham had part of her bow blown off by a torpedo, forcing her to retreat before sinking the following day. It wouldn't be long before the fourth and final destroyer, USS Gwyn, took a direct hit on her engine room, leaving her no choice but to abandon the fight. 
With the destroyers eliminated, Washington and South Dakota were now left on their own to face the strength of Commodore's warships. Arriving on the scene of the carnage still littered with the wreckage of her former escorts, Washington spotted the Japanese destroyer Ayanani and opened fire with her secondary batteries, setting the enemy vessel ablaze. However, this moment of triumph would prove to be short-lived, as South Dakota, which had been following closely behind Washington, suddenly experienced electrical failures, knocking her radar, radios, and the majority of her gun batteries out of action. As the two battleships had to cautiously maneuver their way through the marine battlefield in order to avoid the sinking destroyers, a series of abrupt turns soon found them separated from one another. South Dakota was now extremely vulnerable. She was isolated, effectively blind, and unable to use her guns. To make matters worse, having changed course to avoid hitting the crippled Venom, her silhouette was brightly drawn by the flame from the burning destroyers, making her a sitting duck for the approaching Japanese Navy. Sure enough, by the time the clock struck midnight, most of Kondo's force had now united, and seeing the severely disadvantaged battleship ahead joined together in a relentless assault. Although she had been able to use her few functioning guns to land a few hits on Kirishima, by the end of the intense encounter, South Dakota had been hit 26 times, setting her upper decks on fire and completely destroying her communication systems, as well as what was left of her gunfire control operations. Admiral Lee later said that the Japanese had managed to, quote, render one of our new battleships deaf, dumb, blind, and impotent. Unable to continue fighting, the battered South Dakota bowed out and began heading for safety. The Allies' sole hope of victory in the battle now rested on the shoulders of USS Washington. Though the odds were stacked against her, she soon saw her chance. As the Japanese focused on their pursuit of South Dakota, determined to finish off the crippled vessel, they failed to notice Washington advancing on rival battleship Kirishima. Sneaking into position, she opened fire, subjecting her unsuspecting victim to a brutal pounding in close range. The damage was serious. Kirishima burst into flames and started rapidly filling with water. All her main gun turrets knocked out, leaving her utterly defenseless in the face of Washington's assault. She was hit below the surface, jamming her rudder and causing her to circle uncontrollably. With Kirishima effectively neutralized, Washington was now free to turn her attention to the heavy cruisers Atago and Takao, and Lee gave the order to open fire. Determined not to suffer the same fate as Kirishima, the pair of Japanese warships pulled back in preparation for torpedo attacks. The two sides were now in the midst of a fierce skirmish, but somehow, neither one was able to hit their target. Suddenly, Japanese reinforcements arrived in the form of two destroyers who had been escorting a convoy of transports nearby. Realizing there was no way Washington could come out victorious against the emboldened opposition in a firefight, Lee instead strategically opted to flee the scene. Not only did he want to avoid getting hit, but he also hoped to lure the enemy away from South Dakota, Benham, and Gwim, all badly hit, but still afloat in the area. As she turned around to make her escape, flurries of torpedoes came chasing her from behind, yet Washington avoided their wrath as she successfully drew the Japanese fleet away from the damaged American vessels. After an hour of hot pursuit, Kondo eventually gave up, allowing Washington to make her getaway. By the time Japanese destroyers made it back to the gravely wounded Kirishima, they found her engulfed in flames and smoke, still slowly circling as she continued to flood, eventually capsizing and sinking at 3.25 a.m. Meanwhile, Ayanami was abandoned and scuttled before joining Kirishima in her watery grave. Thanks to Washington's impressive display of strategic acumen, tenacity, and courage in the face of danger, the U.S. Navy was successfully able to prevent Kondo's planned bombardment of Guadalcanal. Furthermore, by disrupting the convoy of transports to the island, she destroyed their hopes of disembarking under cover of darkness, resulting in them falling victim to an attack from Allied aircraft, ships, and artillery that morning. Following her stellar performance at Guadalcanal, USS Washington continued to play a supporting role in Allied operations in the Pacific, participating in campaigns in the Gilbert and Marshall Islands, the Mariana and Palau Islands, the Philippines, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. She was decommissioned on October 27, 1947, and after most of her armament was taken for use on other battleships during the 1950s, she was sold for scrap on May 24, 1961, and broken up soon afterward. While USS Washington may no longer physically exist, the stories of her heroics at the Battle of Guadalcanal will last for many generations to come.